Hello and welcome back to a new, another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up this week with some new music, which is why that word was on my mind. Checking out a track that came out last week, I think. Caligula Horse has put out a new official video for their album that comes out next week. Let me check the calendar real quick. Yeah, next Friday. Exactly one week from today. That album's called Charcoal Grace. The track we're looking at today is called The Storm Chaser. we got an official music video for it. Let's dive in see what's going on with Caligula's Horse. Very prog rock. It's creepy just to look over in the forest and some dudes over there. In all black, nonetheless. Robes. Oh, yeah. Such a tasty laid back rhythm. Love that bass. kick and guitar lining up rhythmically with the vocalist on that. With the vocalizations and guitar work on the outside just holding out these notes. So good. Oh, a little bit of a lift harmonically at the end of that to lead us into that uh, last high note that sort of fades out there. But it was it was pointing towards this big belt, and we only got we got that falsetto that fades out. Really interesting subversion of expectation on that. That's creepy too. This music video's got a lot of weird things going on in it. I love how they keep the energy. It has nice drive to it, but it can be laid back and relaxed atmospherically. Really great melodic drumming. the vocal layers another great with really great rhythmic layering Chorus. A bit of a choppy rhythm here. I'm curious what the intention is behind that. Oh, yeah, let's go. Jumping into that just a half beat early. I 
love the bass and the guitar tones together here. I would have liked a little bit more foreshadowing on that, but it was it was all right. Attention to the release. There's so much going on in this moment. I kind of wish I was the person who got goosebumps while listening to music because I really think the final chorus would have done that. It's just, man, there's so much good stuff. The thing is, is that our final chorus is the, it's a really, I was going to say the ultimate. Yeah. Let's get rid of the hyperbole. It's a great example of utilizing many of the ideas that we've been building the song upon and presenting them simultaneously as a culmination, as a peak of what the song is about musically. I don't know if I could necessarily say that all the themes come together here, but many of the building blocks, the ways that they create the sections individually in this track are all put into effect at the same time here. For instance, there is this lighter backbeat that presents itself in here. First of all, it is a bit of an adaptation of the rhythmic pattern in our first verse, but it's also what drives the chorus from the very beginning. So we have this foundation in our final chorus that says, hey, this is still our chorus. You know, we still have the vocal melody on top here as well. But we've taken the chords that we have typically had in the chorus and we've inverted them a little bit. We've added a bit of darkness into the third one to create a rise in our fourth that directs us to another rise as we reset our chord progression and start back over again. There is this ascent that happens towards the end of our final chorus, at least in the four bar phrase, that we don't hear the first two times through the chorus. Those are more cyclical. They have the rise and the fall. This is a consistent rise out of the end of it. This is also met with the guitar. Guitars? I think there's two. Playing these chords out around the band, really creating this wall around the drums and our main melody going on in the middle. This is similar to what we had in the chorus but of course, we're playing different chords here. On top of all this, there's a new melody that's going on in the background that's doing counterpoint against the vocals, which is something we saw in the bridge, I think it was. Um, and so we have this other section to our, our final chorus here that recontextualizes what it is. It's not just a single person surrounded by this atmosphere. They are with something else here. I'm not sure how to read it yet, but I do like how we have this second guitar line in here that is playing uh, against what the vocals are doing. And on top of all that, we have our bass, which the first time through the chorus 
played with the bass kick, playing that same rhythm and just kind of filling out the low end, while here plays a line that feels like it came from the section where it played with the guitar solo in the bridge, but it's not one-to-one. -one. So we have a little bit of everything that we've seen previously. We, we have the atmospheric rhythmic elements, we have atmospheric um, harmonic elements, we have the melodies one for one, taking the chorus melody and utilizing it here. We also have a brand new melody, uh, counterpoint, and then we have the bass line doing its melodic foundation line. That's sort of like what we had earlier with counterpoint, but this time a little less busy in order to help it fit better into the foundation since we already have a counterpoint line. It is just so phenomenally done. It is the culmination. It's not just that this is the peak of intensity or the peak of layering or anything like that. It is layered more densely than the rest of the track. It is more energetic and more powerful, sure but it's also a piece of everything shown together here. It is, it is masterful. I absolutely love it. And, you know, it, it gets repeated a few times there in the final chorus. And of course the melody, we've heard that a couple of times in the previous times we've been in the chorus. But this is one of those moments where it just works for me because it's not just the repetition. And it is more than just revisiting the chorus because that's what you do at the end of the song. It has reason to be here. It is all of the pieces that were felt disparately before combined together to their full form. It's just mm, so good. Now, I've kind of touched on some of the things already that I want to talk about. Uh, I probably shouldn't have started with um, let's talk about everything at once. <laughs> Probably should have went piecewise and then talked about how those pieces fit together to the ending, but I was just so psyched about it. I had to bring that up first. Um, the bass though. I love the bass tone in general. It has punch, it has width, but it's not ridiculously big. It's definitely a rock sound, not like a jazzy bass sound. But it also is narrow enough and pointed enough that it can carry lead lines when it needs to. It really walks a fine line between a foundational sound and a lead sound. And, you know, I don't know if we've talked about this before. Are there a lot of bassists who utilize multiple timbres? Because like when we talk about even rock, I suppose, but certainly metal, your guitarists are going to have their riff tone their rhythm guitar tone when they're just playing chords and then their lead tone and they're going to switch between them on the fly as they're needed if they shift down the chords they go for a wider flatter sound if they're going for uh you know a lead riff they'll hit something on their their pedals or whatever it'll switch up their sound it'll be a little bit more narrow and directed but still something that fits into the background well and when they go for their solos, they're going to switch to a completely different set of effects and settings and stuff. And they might even change the pickups that they're using as well. A lot of work goes into ensuring that the guitar sounds right for every moment. You don't hear this too often with the bass. Right here, I'm talking about how this is a perfectly balanced sound for pretty much anything the bassist would need to play. And it just dawned on me, why wouldn't the bassist have... A more foundational wider tone for those segments where it's lining up with the bass kick and just being this low end sound and a narrower more directed forward play sound when it needs to play lead like counterpoint in the bridge why don't bassists do this <laughs> i'm sure there are it, it it's highly improbable but that nobody treats their bass guitar like guitarists treat their tone but it seems to be such a rarity. It is certainly the exception to the rule. Regardless, though, the bass sounds great in all sections. Maybe it could sound better if it, you know, honed the sound it needed for each, each role that it takes up. But the bass sounds great in all the sections. It just has a really nice, warm, punchy tone. But it's not too fat, but isn't too narrow either. It straddles the line it finds a very thin line and walks it um, and the bass lines in here are 
great as well. A lot of it does tend to be a bit more foundational, walking bass lines, uh, you know, sitting alongside what the, the bass kick is doing, allowing the vocals and the guitars to really take many of the lead roles. But when the bass dis decides to take some of the spotlight, it's so good. And its addition to the final chorus is such a delight because it does sort of walk that middle line again. It's, it's not purely foundational like our opening verse and chorus, but it's not completely lead like in our bridge either. It finds the middle grounds. It's just it's so good. It's so good. The drumming is also fantastic in here. There's a ton of contrast going on. There's a bunch of different rhythms. I love the drum fills. They come quick, which is an odd compliment. I do feel like we get more drum fills than I expect, but it also sort of feels like the drummer just is a bit more melodic. It's been a long time since we've listened to Caligula's Horse, so I don't quite remember exactly what type of prog rock they make. Yeah, it's not like some of the other bands that we've checked out five, six, seven, eight, nine songs. And I'm like, I know who this band is. Caligula's Horse is just a modern rock band to me. I kind of put them in the same area as Leprous, but with Leprous, I've heard more tracks and I kind of have an idea of what each of the musicians bring to the table. Their, their unique voice for things. Cal Caligula's Horse is just sort of a vague, they play prog rock in my mind. So I don't think I was expecting this much melodic drumming going on. It definitely sits within the groove a lot of the time, but given just how many fills we have and how experimental the sparse drumming gets, it comes off as super melodic in my mind, just kind of retroactively compressing the whole song down into one word or the whole drumming set into one word. It would be melodic, even though the drummer does tend to be, uh, like I said, sitting within the groove and, and playing a pattern for a lot of the track. I greatly appreciate that. There's a lot of cool things going on with the melody lines. Oh man, the melody lines. Oh, I, I guess it's sort of mixed melody and harmony because they'll, they'll set something up. They'll sing a melody line a few times. They'll play some chords under it and we'll go through the pattern. I'm like, okay, I know this four bar loop now, you know, I know what's going on here. And then and then they, they don't, they change it up a little bit. Not necessarily always in a way that is just for the section. Sometimes it is just to subvert what we expect, but also sometimes it's to lead us into the next idea. And I really love that because not only does it recontextualize the vibes of where we've been, but it directs us to where we are going. And it makes the entire song just feel ridiculously fluid you know, if, if you remember back to yesterday, we checked out uh, Edge of Sanity, Crimson. That was one of my biggest things on it was uh, fluidity of ideas of how everything feels interconnected. I really love music that goes that route. That's not to say disconnected music is, is bad or a poor way to write music. I just really like personally, you know, subjectively, I like things to 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 feel connected. So I'll, I'll feel like it's telling me one solid idea. I want to make a vlog about this. I have a lot to say about this topic, but it's so vague. I always feel weird to put it in any specific reaction because it has very little to do with, in this case, the storm chaser. It's more of overarching ideas, but, but yeah, just like everything just flows on this and I love it. The entire solo section also was fantastic. Um, it introduced a new side. It, it brought us back to an atmosphere that we had visited during the first verse. Light, spacious, sparse playing. We get this nice guitar work over it. The timbre shifts from the rock, the distortion that they have here, into uh, a bit of a, a razor-honed, clean electric feels very jazzy to me. They don't go into jazzy chords or melodies. It's just the tone itself feels like something I would hear in uh, like a big band group. And again, when you mix it with the bass, like the whole section's nice. There's great pause and pacing to the solo. I love the way that it escalates over time. I just wish that the ending had a little bit more thought put into it. It really could have taken another bar or two to fully develop what they were doing. They were building this solo into the final chorus, right? That's where we went from it. 
and we get the build up. Uh, the gu the guitar starts to enter some more dissonant tones. It speeds up. We start looking at sixteenth notes. Uh, just gets fast and chaotic. And it takes like two, three beats to do this. And we've had like this lengthy guitar solo and they chose like the last 5% of it to introduce and move into. It's like the opposite of a slow burn <laughs> where a slow burn gradually brings you into the next idea. This one kept you in the idea for a vast majority of it. And at the last second, it's like, oh yeah, we need to, we need to ease them into it and then like rush it. <laughs> I just wish it had a little bit more time to develop that. The fade in, the volume increase, all of that, it, it just, it didn't quite click with me because of that. And I think it would have been really cool if they had taken some of the, the melodic ideas of the, the final chorus where we were going and begin to incorporate that into the guitar line a little bit so it would smoothly transition in, not just from a sonic area where we have the rising volume, where we have the extra tension brought in, where we're returning to the electric guitar instead of I mean the distorted guitar instead of the electric clean but also on a melodic side a, a compositional side to see the writing shift from that more laid back style into this darker side uh, of of melody that's really my only complaint with the whole song is that just that transition I I saw what they were going for it works well on paper it just did not get executed fantastically still like a I'd still give it like a six or a seven out of ten it was good it, it told me what they wanted to I just like I said I think I think it could have been done a little bit better unless that sort of juxtaposition is what they were going for and in that case fantastic I, I don't think casually I enjoyed that but maybe from an artistic perspective it makes sense from that we should segue into Trying to find the artistic perspective. Let's see if we can find some theme in the lyrics and relate that back to anything that the music was doing. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. I love this song. I do. Musically, I was already on board. But lyrically, there's so much cool stuff here as well. Strap in. This ain't going to be like a little three-minute overview. We got some stuff to dive into. I don't know why I said strap in. <laughs> Verse 1 speaks about somebody who was so sure of themselves that they needed no one else. In fact, the very first line says, Never enough truth to keep you safe and well in the cocoon you knit for no one else. You never thought it could change. You could stay the shame. Shame? Same? No, you could stay the shame. Okay, so you could weather out the shame. That's what it is. You never thought it could change, that you could stay the shame. You could never see the water in spite of the rain. Then it rose and you just dove when you needed to float. This idea that you could have been surrounded by others. You could have had a support network, but you chose not to. You made a, a cocoon that was no bigger than you. You were happy sheltering yourself from the world. And when the water started rising, you didn't care. You just saw rain. You didn't even see the danger impending. And when the waters rose, you just dove into it. You went right into the danger. What an idiot. <laughs> you needed to float above it and you went right under. Verse 2 is more anger. Verse 1 kind of feels compassionate with a little bit of disappointment. Verse 2 is just anger. He says, you're proud, your empty hands through the crowd that bears the load. You're so happy. To be alone, to have no support network, and to take any help that you can get from the ones who are trying to help everyone. It says the the crowd bears the load the load, and you're proud of your empty hands. There is spite. There is anger here. I really like the chorus. 
There's only two of them, actually. There is no final chorus. I do like the culmination towards the end. It works with this idea. The entire song is written using language of water and ocean terms. It speaks about animals that you would expect to see around waters. Um, we got anchors and ropes trying to stay afloat, stones in your throat. Um, it's, it's all done with this one lyrical theme as far as vocabulary goes. I like that angle. It finds a synergy already. And then they continue to run with it, this storm that just never ends and the water rises. To me, the beginning of the song is before the water has actually risen. It's why the verse has so much space. And by the end of the song, we are quite in a disaster. There is flooding everywhere. It's going to be noisy. It's going to be chaotic. It's why everything that was present originally is present here at the end to fill the most amount of space, not just to tie the song together musically, finding motifs from earlier to bring in at the end, not even just to tie it together thematically to bring some of the ideas we have heard previously and just bring them here so that we can showcase them as a complete whole. But it also fits with the themes in the lyrics. Not just the concept of being overwhelmed, but also the idea of flooding, of the musical floor rising until the entire sphere is filled. It works on every single freaking level. How? How do people get this good at writing music? I don't know. I'm glad they do, though, because I get to listen to it. <laughs> now, all that stuff in our final chorus, what I called earlier, they have it listed as the bridge after the guitar solo. We'll get into that, but that is where the anger is at the utmost high. At one point, even saying, you condescendingly lied to everyone, Yet you promised love. Is this that love that you promised? How could you be so goddamn blind? It is... It is seething at this point. It, it, we'll, we'll get to the bridge in a second. But I really love the escalation throughout this. Starting with disappointment. And then anger. And then finally resentment and hate. It is palpable because it matches the rising water in the story it matches the rising and escalating volume and size of things in the music everything is at its peak in that bridge before we get there though we need to look at the two choruses what's very cool is they are the same but quite different the first almost speaks of a what if scenario well, it's a what if for this person who prefers to be alone, but it is the experience of the person who has reached out for help. It says, listen to me, into the churn. There will be no pretty words to swallow. This is a test. It's not a war. Watch as we weather the storm together. We are the calm here for the few. We could be shelter in shore, heads above water. So come for the king, stay for the view, proud of the nothing that you grew when we stood against the storm. We came together. We did all this. We helped each other keep our heads above water and we all survived it well. You over there, proud of the nothing that you are. What were you doing when we weathered the storm together? The second chorus, though, once again, as the song has gotten angrier, says, Deafened to me, this is the churn. Watch as you sink in the storm untethered. We are the wild wind to the scorn. We could be shelter and shore, heads above water. You're fighting for nothing but yourself while we stood against the storm. The idea that together through community we can weather anything. And yet you're so proud of being alone that you'd rather drown than join us. Why are you so blind?
there's a fantastic part in this bridge, the final section that we have right before he really starts leaning in and grilling this person. It says, so when we heard that thunder over the wine dark sea, no wave could drag me under an ocean of arms to carry me. I, the undeserving, I, the hanged man, was held aloft and safe at last. Not talking about himself being a great person, perfect, making every right decision in their life. Doesn't even say that they're deserving to have been saved. But pure compassion allowed people to see past what he might have done in the past and save him for being a human. Just another person. It's not about who you are. It's just about helping everyone. He says, so where is your sworn compassion? You speak so high and mighty about helping people. Where were you? Man, I just, I love this. I wish there was a little bit more sting, a little bit more bite in the lyrical delivery, especially towards the end. Maybe I just got to listen to it again. Knowing what's being said, but I mean... Dang. And it's so articulately worded, too. And there's some really cool interline rhyming where they'll go for, like, the meter will be set this long. Let, let me just bring up a, a specific example here. So we have a, a specific length here. Sea and storm, all that was sacrificed, the blood for the pride, the clarion cry. We, we sort of set out how long a line is supposed to be. And all of that, not really having much of a rhyme scheme to it, is then followed up by the stones in your throat, the anchor and rope to keep you afloat. These fast back-to-back -back rhymes. And it just changes up the entire flow of the poem. I, it's, it's another section where I have to go back and listen to it in context and how they deliver it, what kind of pacing and timing they use. But just reading it as a poem completely devoid of the musical element, there's still something really awesome to the ebb and flow of it. It's like water. It's like the ocean. It's like waves. Moments of calm and moments of bite. Moments of free-form thought and then others that get reeled back in, focusing on specific rhythms and rhyme schemes. It's just gorgeous from start to finish. I aside from the the solo into our final bridge, which I still don't think was done expertly given what's going on here. I still think it could have been a hair bit smoother, but I think it's obvious they didn't want that smoothness for whatever reason. I'm just not privy to that knowledge. Everything in here is just perfect and you know, Caligula's Horseman, it's its a band I've enjoyed in the past. I'm pretty sure that some of their older stuff is on my listen list. I haven't gotten around to listening to a whole album, though, I don't think. But this track right here tells me next week I'll be listening to this album. Because if everything else on the album is even just a fraction of as good as this is, it's going to be a phenomenal album. Those are my thoughts on Caligula's horse, the Storm Chaser. Let me know your thoughts on it. Are you as stoked for the album as I am? Did you enjoy this as much as I did? This is certainly up my... I don't know, man. My voice doesn't usually get this horse talking about music, but I just had so much I needed to say. All right. That wraps it up for this. Actually, for all of today. Give me your thoughts, comments, perspectives, opinions down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box. Uh, what, what is it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a link in there for Linktree. <laughs> I'm so focused on like, I'm like, let's finish this video. I have music I need to listen to from Caligula's Horse. <laughs> Maybe I'll go uh, beg the record label for an early release. On. I, I need to listen to this. I do. All right, anyways, uh, back into outro, mind. 
Linktree takes you to this menu. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC, as usual. We're going to check out a full album. Um, fingers crossed. My favorite EPs of 2023 will be released tomorrow morning at, like, 10 a.m., Progress is going good, and it looks on track to be released by then. But it's still, it's been a busy week, and I have, it's a busy tomorrow, <laughs> as far as a work day goes. It might not. I don't know. We'll have to see. I, You know, I record all these a day in advance so that I can get them out for early access for the patrons, so... It is Thursday. I have tomorrow to finish working on the video. I, I think it's possible. Anyways, until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos.